Um, thank you. Yeah, thank you for that. And that's very refreshing to hear that somebody with an HR background likes the functional. I've just found that even for those that uh, don't like the functional, whether they be recruiters or HR managers, that they'll call my clients and they'll say, this is great, but I need a chronological. Mm -hmm. You know, I, mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't like functional. Give me a chronological. But at least they've gotten that phone call. And they right. may not have gotten the phone call before, especially if, like you said, they're seasoned mm -hmm. and they have something 15 or 17 years ago that they're really proud of that they want right. up front and center and not buried on the third mm -hmm. page. Yeah. Yeah. Now, it's not to yeah. say that, that everybody else has the same mindset you and I do, and it's not to say that you'll submit a resume and it's skills-based and it won't immediately get put into that circular file. I think that may still happen. But I think more and more hiring managers and recruiters are being open to both formats. Yeah. And there's something also that's novel about the skills-based resume that I think gets some attention as well, because it doesn't look like everybody else's. Mm -hmm. it's, You're right. It does look different. Ninety-eight percent of the resumes that come across my desk are, are uh, chronological and, mm -hmm. and just have a bullet-pointed list of job descriptions. And right. that's, to me, that's not persuasive enough for someone to get a phone call from somebody. Well, good. Thank you very much. Um, now let's shift on to how you select the candidates you do find mm -hmm. and, okay. and move them forward in the process. I want to remind everybody who's listening, if you have questions for Deborah of anything that we're talking about, just type them in. If you're online, it looks like a, a lot of people are online today. So type those in, and then if you do have a question and you're on the phone, raise your hand and we'll get to you in about 15 or 20 minutes. But you can raise your hand now. Type up those questions now so we have plenty of them ready to go uh, toward the end of the call. Now, let's take a couple of scenarios. For okay. instance, if, if you were to look at two candidates, this is kind of an either-or situation. If you were to look at two candidates and one that – might be older with more experience, relevant experience, and then one with more education or training, which would you prefer to move forward in the process, meaning which would you choose to have a conversation with? Mm -hmm. I think it goes back, Tammy, to the comment that I made a little bit earlier about looking for that well-rounded person. Certainly the education and training is, is, um, is critical. But I also think in, especially in today's environment, um, there's a little bit of a gap between those folks who have been in the work environment for several years who are very seasoned and those folks mm -hmm. who are maybe just coming out of school or who have only been in the work environment for, let's say, six or seven years. I think a lot of companies are finding that there's a gap, and in some cases they're reaching out and hiring on a contract basis maybe, some of those more seasoned folks, so they can bring some of that historical knowledge back into the company. Um, so I'm not going to say that I'm going to discount either one of them. Um, mm -hmm. I, think, I think, you know, one thing you have, to be, you have to really have in mind is what is it you're exactly looking for? What's the need that you're looking to fill when you're hiring this person? Um, so maybe you're hiring, you know, for a technical position, and you need somebody that has very, very current technical skills. Well, that's where then the education and training may be a little more critical. Um, so I, again, it, it for me at any rate, it's looking at that holistic, that well-rounded individual, um, and then looking to see, you know, is there the culture fit, which, of course, you don't see that until you talk to the person. But just looking at the mm -hmm. two resumes, I want to see somebody who's really well-rounded. And, I, you know, if, I'm not going to discount one or the other because of education or because of um, experience. Mm -hmm. Okay. And um, just as a background question, for mm -hmm. some recent – positions that you've filled and that you've gone mm -hmm. through the process, how many resumes are you looking for and how many of those do you actually reach out and contact and call and then how many mm -hmm. do you bring in? I mean, do you talk with them face-to-face -face, or mm -hmm. uh, is it just a phone call and then you send them on to a, a departmental hiring manager? Mm -hmm. You know, I, I'm not looking for volume, Tammy, when I'm looking at resumes. So if I run across somebody, you know, your resume comes in today somebody else's comes in tomorrow, but both of them look good, you know, I'll reach out to both of those folks. I'm not necessarily waiting until I get a, you know, a pile of 25 or 30 resumes and then I start 
culling through them. So as I see a resume that comes through and somebody that looks like a viable candidate, I will reach out to them. My process is to initially just make a phone call, um, you know, 15, 20 minutes. And what I'm looking for is, you know, some, over the phone, you can tell these things, you know, somebody with some personality, someone who can talk about their past experience just a little bit, what they might be able to bring to the job. I always ask them why they're interested in working for the company. Um, and then typically, if I decide to move them on in the process, the next step would be to have a face-to-face -face with me. And then I would dig in really um, a little bit more into their accomplishments. You know, tell me about what you did in this situation or tell me a little bit more about, you know, what you have listed here on your resume. Next step mm -hmm. then would be with the hiring manager. Um, and then it depends on where it goes from there. In some companies, they want there to be um, a group interview, maybe either with peers that the individual would be working with, could be with the rest of the management team if it's a smaller company. And then mm -hmm. sometimes, not always, but again, in the case of a smaller company, there might be that final interview with the president or the CEO, that kind of blessing interview, if you will. And again, that individual is mm -hmm. looking for a culture fit. Okay. Okay, but uh, you know something that you said early on in that mm -hmm. answer really uh, reminded me how important it is to quantify your experience, to quantify mm -hmm. your achievements, so that when you are talking to them face to face as an HR manager or as a recruiter, that you've the the candidate has achievements that they can point to that end in, whether it be a dollar amount or maybe a reduction mm -hmm. in man hours or a reduction in cycle time, maybe an increase in customer satisfaction, whatever it is that they do, that it's quantified. So that's really mm -hmm. important to, to work on that ahead of time so that that hard work is done before mm -hmm. you get into an interview and you're not left thinking back and trying to quantify things as mm -hmm. you're in the interview. That's not the right time to do that. But really when I'm doing that work ahead of time. When I coach candidates um, exactly to what you're saying, Tammy, I often suggest that they have almost a book of stories. So to your point, do a lot of that work ahead of time. Come up with some stories that really talk about the situation, what you did, your accomplishments, and then what the result was. Um, so that they have that book, you review it periodically, especially when you're getting ready for an interview, and then, you know, mm -hmm. those stories can just kind of roll off your tongue. Yeah, yeah. Now, let me ask you something. That brings me to a really good question, because mm -hmm. there's okay. a piece of advice that I give my clients. Well, we have all good questions, but it's a piece of advice <laughs> I give my clients, and they're always kind of hesitant to follow it, but I make them follow it anyway, and it's mm -hmm. just they say it's the best thing ever. I tell them, type up a cheat sheet that has just uh, like two columns, where on the left-hand column you've got just a few words that remind you of a story that you're proud of, of an achievement. Mm -hmm. And then beside that, tab over and put that quantifiable result. So mm -hmm. you've got a one-pager, and I say take it with you, not only yeah. in the phone interviews, but face-to-face -face interview. Put it in a mm -hmm. portfolio book, open it up, and there's your cheat sheet to refer to as you're talking mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. a, an employer. And every single one of my clients says, uh, uh, won't they think that's cheating? And I'm like, mm -hmm. no, they think you're prepared. You're actually mm -hmm. working, and, and it's, it, it shows that you're coming in prepared. You know, I've got 18 years of hiring manager experience, and if somebody comes in, especially a high-level position, and has something typed up for me that that they're looking at, plus uh, the uh, all of the questions that they have for me typed up, I'm impressed. Mm -hmm. So, from your experience, I mean, if somebody came in with a cheat sheet and they were referring to it, what would be your viewpoint on that? Oh, exactly what you just said, Tammy. I would think that they were extremely prepared. Um, that they really did want the job, that they weren't just sitting there using my time and using their time, you know, less productively than we could be, but that they are very serious about the position, that they've given some thought to it, they've done their research, um, they've thought about what questions they would want to ask, and then they, you know, can very clearly speak to their um, their accomplishments. I, I see nothing wrong with it at all, Tammy, not a thing. Well, thank you. <laughs> I'm glad to hear that. Well, and, and, and I, it's... Go, Go ahead. ahead. Well, I, uh, I've i noticed that the biggest difference in having that cheat sheet 
is that you walk in with a great sense of confidence because you're mm -hmm. not worried about memorizing every single story in your history and right. your background, that you've got that sheet. And you know that you can you can look on it. Oftentimes you don't have to, but mm -hmm. you know that it's there. You know that it's it's right there with you and you don't have to memorize everything. Absolutely, absolutely. And I don't mind when candidates ask me if they can take, take notes, you know, and I would suggest that before you just assume that that's okay, you know, as the conversation gets started, just say, do you mind if I take notes? I want to, I want to make sure that I remember everything that we chat about. And in most cases, um, you know, the interviewer will say, sure, no problem at all. That's great advice. Very good. And, and so now let's talk about some of the liabilities that people might have, some obstacles that they need to overcome in their search. Mm -hmm. I call them liabilities, but really they're anything that might keep you from getting an initial phone call from HR mm -hmm. or might keep you from getting the job. Um, mm -hmm. And one that routinely comes up for my clients, because a lot of them are searching for six-figure positions, is being overqualified. They've mm -hmm. got a lot of experience, a lot of good experience, and in this job market, many times they feel they have to apply for positions that maybe in other job markets, in healthier job markets, they may not need to apply for. Mm -hmm. So what would advice would you give to someone who might be considered a little bit overqualified for a position or yeah. maybe a lot overqualified for a position? You know, personally, from a coaching perspective, Tammy, this is where I would say to that individual, you know, I, I – fully understand that maybe you need to take a survival job, but are you really going to be happy in that job? Is this your dream job? Are you going to be challenged in the position? The other thing that I would, would coach them on, too, is once you are in a job, it's difficult for you to continue looking for another job. You know, most people want to be fully engaged in what they're doing. It's not as easy to go interview because you are working eight to five or whatever the case might be. Um, yeah. Maybe not able to take phone calls, you know, or have some of that flexibility. So, I'd really encourage people to 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 keep following down that path of looking for a job that they are truly qualified for. And I know that's tough. It's a very fine line that you walk there. Um, but, you know, engage engage with a coach. Engage with someone like you, Tammy, that really can just jettison people to the top of the list and, um, yeah. you know, and help them with every tool possible to get that dream job. Yeah, thank you. And I, I often say to people, you need to be paid what you're worth. And mm -hmm. it's not so much the money. Everybody believes it's about the money, but it's not. Mm -hmm. It's about mm -hmm. the level of job responsibility. And if you're at the level that challenges you and that you're accustomed to and maybe even stretches you a little bit, you're going mm -hmm. to be so much happier in that position than a job that you can do blindfolded two weeks after you start. Exactly. So I'm, Absolutely. Yeah, I have the exact same opinion. You, frankly, I say if you feel overqualified, then you are and you shouldn't then be applying you are. for that. Apply for something mm -hmm. else. Yeah. Right. You know, another very popular topic is ageism, uh, and mm -hmm. the majority of my clients are over 50 years old. Mm -hmm. So how do you perceive someone who is older mm -hmm. that comes to you? I perceive that person as We talked as a little being, bit about that. Yeah, yeah, and I'm, I'm going to kind of go back to that, really, because I see that individual as being um, someone who just has a boatload of historical knowledge between their, knee, between their ears, um, you know, mm -hmm. someone who I would really want to have on my team because they could probably just walk in the door and, you know, immediately embrace the job, start bringing value to the organization. Doesn't mean that mm -hmm. someone younger can't, and I, you know, I certainly believe in giving um, those folks an opportunity too, but I'm not going to discount someone because of their age because I just think there's too much value that they can bring to the organization. And again, I think that's that's where we're finding a gap, Tammy, quite honestly, is, yeah. Yeah. you know, there's not been any um, succession planning. There's not been any um, grooming of potential managers, younger people who might be moving into a management position. And, and I'm not going to say that that's the case in all companies, but I think in a lot of companies that has been the case. And um, yeah. too often maybe they, they think that, okay, we're going to, we're going to let go of some of those more seasoned people because they're at a higher salary level. 
We'll bring in some more people. We're looking to cut, you know, cut costs. And it comes down to that, unfortunately. And now all of a sudden they're finding that there is a gap. Yeah, yeah, I agree. And I have found, at least with my clients, that people, uh, the companies are starting to hire older people more often yes. now. They're finding that gap, and they, right. they start replacing them with some of the type of people that they were letting go before. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And, and that's good. For anybody that's uh, listening, I would want you to, if you have a specific obstacle that you need strategies to overcome, feel free to uh, to write out that question if you're listening online or raise your hand. And it uh, looks like we've got several questions already, already but I want to keep those questions coming too. Um, and I can tell you that there isn't an obstacle out there that you can't overcome. It's just what strategy do you use? There mm-hmm. are just strategies to overcome. I've found that uh, I have seen some ageism in, in some hiring processes at starting about age 58 or more, especially mm-hmm. in the 60s. But it's it, you're, av- you're able to overcome that. You just have to have right. strategies to overcome it. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. Well, let's talk about interviewing for a little bit. Do okay. you have a couple of favorite interview questions that you always like to use when interviewing? I do. I do. Um, Bring one on. question. <laughs> one question that I usually ask towards the end is, um, "What do I need to know about you that I don't already know?" So give them an oh, opportunity. Give them an opportunity to share just a little bit more um, about them. Uh-huh. Certainly, I'm not looking for anything that would cross, you know, HR barriers. But give them one more opportunity to tell me why they're the best candidate for the position or tell me about your volunteer work or tell me, you know, just a little bit more about your passions and what you like to do. Um, I think it it helps to maybe more personalize the interview and helps to make that connection between myself and the person that I'm interviewing. Um, Mm -hmm. I also like to ask Tammy, how would a friend describe you? You know, oftentimes as part of the interview, it's, you know, how would a former manager describe you or how would, you know, one of your peers or someone you worked with describe you? Okay, now how would a friend describe you? And and it may not be in a professional perspective. It may be more on a personal perspective. But oftentimes that will lead to answers like, um, I'm reliable, I'm honest, I'm ethical, I'm fun, Um, you know, which, Mm -hmm. again, tells me just that much more about the person. Um, yeah. And one other thing that I like to ask is, what's the last business book that you read, and what did you like about that book? Um, ah. Tell me a couple of things. You know, are you a continuous learner? Do you like to continue right. to learn? Now, the downside to that is not everybody's a reader. <laughs> um, right. I think, when, I think when you get to folks who are, are at more of an executive level, and I don't mean to put everybody in this box, but – um, mm-hmm. You know, a lot of C-level or executive-level people do like to read a lot because there's just a lot of good business books out there. Um, and yeah. and it's a little selfish on my part, too. I'm always looking for a good book to read. And if somebody's going to yeah. recommend one, I may run out and look at it. <laughs> <laughs> That's excellent. And, you know, uh, something else to to your first question, what uh-huh. else do, do I need to know about you? Mm-hmm. I think if an HR person or even if a – a decision maker at, doesn't ask that question. A good question to ask the the decision maker is, "What else do you need to know about me that can help you make a decision?" Good. Because it Absolutely. might not be. Yeah, it might not have. They may not have covered everything they really wanted to cover. Sometimes that mm-hmm. that happens, and so it at least gives them the opportunity to think about it and think, "Okay, is there anything else I need to know to make a decision about this person?" Yeah. Great, yeah. great point, Tammy. Great point. So a, a couple of um, body language questions mm-hmm. really quickly. Mm-hmm. Uh, okay. Do you immediately exclude anybody who's overly nervous? Some people just aren't good interviewers and they're very nervous. And is there any such thing as being too confident during mm-hmm. an interview? And how much does body language play a part in the interview? Okay. Let me start with your first question. Um, do I exclude sure. anyone who is overly nervous? Typically, I don't, because to your point, Tammy, um, I know a lot of people who are just really great, productive employees, and they just cannot interview. So oftentimes, <laughs> if I if yeah. I see somebody who comes in who's not comfortable, 
you know, I'll try to break the ice, and let's not even talk about the job. Let's not get into behavioral interviewing questions. Let's just talk about what you've been doing lately or, you know, um, it, it's spring outside. It's beautiful, you know. So what have you been doing to get outside? Or, or I see on their, their resume that they're involved with a volunteer group. Tell me about the work that you do with the volunteer group. So trying to get them to loosen up a little bit. Um, we just are not all good public speakers. We don't all interview well, and I don't want to discount someone because of that. So I try to make that personal connection and make them feel a little bit more comfortable. Mm -hmm. um, such a thing as being too confident during an interview, certainly I want somebody who's confident and feels very comfortable in their own skin and about what they can do. I think there is a fine line there, though, when you get to someone who is, um, almost pushy, and, and I think there's a difference between being pushy and being overconfident. Um, okay. You know, the person how would you pushy, describe? Yeah, how would you describe pushy? I would describe a pushy person as someone who just keeps going on and on and on about what they can do and what they could do for me and doesn't even give me an opportunity to get a word in. Um, you know, uh -huh. almost to the point where, and again, I hate to put people in a box, but almost where they're a used car salesman, you know, and they're mm -hmm. just pushing and pushing and pushing until you finally go, okay, fine, you've got it. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. I, that that's yeah. kind of the difference for me. Um, certainly I want somebody, you know, who feels very comfortable about themselves and is confident in what they can do. Um, so I, I think there's just kind of a fine line there. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Okay, okay. And, the, and how much does body language play a part? You know, do you, um, do you it, consciously look at that? And I do, I do, Tammy. Um, interesting statistics. Um, from a communication perspective, um, mm -hmm. about 7% of your communication is verbal and how you express yourself. Um, about 38% yeah. of your communication then is the intonation in your voice and the excitement that you can convey with your voice. And actually that visual piece of the communication then accounts for about 55% of your communication style. So that's important. And I, I really think I really think that that body language is, is critical, Tammy. You know, I want someone who's got good eye contact with me. I want somebody who's not swiveling back and forth in their chair or tapping their foot constantly or <laughs> twiddling yeah. with their hair, you know, or something like that. Um, yeah. To me, that just that just shows that they're, I mean, number one, obviously, maybe not comfortable, but... I want them to be more aware of what they're saying to me and and be comfortable in sharing with me. So I think that that I think that that body language does play a very critical part in the interview. Are there any red flags that you can think of off the top of your head? You know, if somebody's slouching down in their chair, or I know me personally, if I'm um, interviewing with somebody and there's a window behind them, I want to look outside all the time. And I catch myself going, <laughs> no, 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 you can't do that, because then I'm sending the yeah. signal that it's more important for me to see what's going on outside just because I love being outside. Um, yeah. It, you know, as opposed to, so it's things like that. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I think I think personal appearance becomes important, too. Um, if you're mm -hmm. not sure when you go to an interview what you should be wearing, go sit in the parking lot of the company that you're going to be interviewing for at 8 o'clock in the morning when people are walking in or at noon That's when people are walking tip. out for lunch. Uh -huh. And just see. And I and I always encourage people to dress just, you know, like one notch up. Now, obviously, <laughs> I always say two notches up. So that's, well, that's, that's good. <laughs> you know, yeah, obviously, yeah. if you're you're applying for a manufacturing position, um, which you know a lot of the folks on the phone may not be, I think. Um, but if you are, um, and you're going to be out in a plant, then certainly, you know, the suit may not be the right thing to wear. But you know, maybe a nice pair of slacks and a button-down shirt or something like that. So, um, yeah. just if if you're unsure, just Go sit and put yourself in that environment, you know, inconspicuously, but put yourself in that environment and see what people are wearing. That's great, great advice. 
Okay. I did want to get to one more thing before we get sure. to the questions. And and that is I'd love for you to talk about the relationship that you have as an HR manager or maybe even as a recruiter with mm-hmm. the departmental hiring manager, the mm-hmm. person that would be our listener's boss. So can you walk us through the process of working with that person? How do you work with them? What are your discussions like? How closely are you working with them? And what kind of input do you give and how heavily, you don't have to answer all these, but how heavily do your recommendations influence the right. final decision? 